with the family of God. Would you please find in your Bible John chapter 6? We're continuing our study on the Gospel of John. Sure appreciate Caleb last week talking to us about the power of Christ to bring calm in the chaos seas of life. Today, it's going to be focused on the bread of life discourse. That's what it tends to be called, the bread of life discourse, where Jesus says he's the bread of life, and he explains that idea to us. Now, bread is a staple food that's been enjoyed throughout history by pretty much every culture, every time and place has enjoyed bread. One fascinating aspect of bread is its incredible diversity because in all those various cultures, there's different kinds of bread that stand out in different areas and different people like to make it certain ways and different cultures have preferences in how they prefer uh, their bread. In the Middle East, they would have pita bread, right? It's soft, but it's thicker. And then some of you, when you go home today, are going to choose between soft shell tacos and hard shell tacos. It's amazing what a little bit of yeast and salt and water and flour can do. Now, speaking of flour, it was a couple of months ago, Terry asked me to buy tapioca flour for her at the store. How many of you did not know that was a thing, tapioca flour? Thank you for that show of hands. Because you're with me. I was like, there's tapioca pudding. I could be glad to bring that home. There's tapioca couple other versions of tapioca so I finally had to ask for help so if you need tapioca flour check in with me I can tell you exactly where it is at the store Um, today I can I would not have been able to two months ago but that got me thinking about if there's tapioca flour what else is there now my yard is full of acorns I have three oak trees and did you know there's acorn flour so some of you maybe nut flour is your thing and so it might be acorn or almond flour And, of course, we think of wheat or corn, so we're growing some kind of grain. So there's barley flour and rye flour. But if some people would have their way, you've probably heard of some conspiracy theorists think they all want us to eat crickets. Well, there's a cricket flour. I looked into that. It's super high in protein, and then it tends to have, like, sometimes the long back legs get through the processing, and it comes out. So you want to strain your flour if you get the cricket flour uh, there. But maybe it's chickpea flour. Uh, Who knows? It's amazing what you can do with a little bit of flour and salt and, and such. Now, the fact that there's this universality when it comes to flour and to bread, so when Jesus says he's the bread of life, He wasn't just speaking truth to people 2,000 years ago. He was speaking relevant truth to the rest of us throughout time. And it speaks to us today because we can all understand food as the staple of life. We all understand the basic foundation. I've got to have sustenance. I've got to be sustained in life. So Jesus fed the 5,000 and then he followed that up the next day by saying, I and the bread of life. So as we start this discourse, the bread of life discourse, let me offer a couple of contradictory, uh, contradictory, introductory thoughts, excuse me, introductory thoughts. I hope that in your minds, as we're going through the gospel of John, there's some things that are resonating for you. For example, I just hope that right off the cuff, you're able to say Jesus and Nicodemus chapter three, that that just comes to mind. The Samaritan woman, John chapter 4, and if you were just thinking, where would I find Jesus and the Samaritan woman? You could just call to mind John chapter 4. Well, I hope the same happens for you when it comes to Jesus and the bread of life. Where would that be at? John chapter 6, he feeds the 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, and then he moves into the bread of life discourse. And I just hope that comes naturally to you over time. So a couple of... uh, introductory thoughts. One, this discourse follows the feeding of the 5,000. So he does this miracle of quantity that 5,000 men plus women and children, it's thought that maybe 20,000 people were there. And uh, he follows that up. This is the next day. The night 
after he fed the 5,000 is when he walks on water. And Caleb presented that message last week talking to us about how Jesus brings calm into the chaos waters of our life. When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, it's the first of seven I am statements that he makes in the Gospel of John. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine, and you are the branches. So Jesus gives these statements, and they were especially significant to the Jewish listeners of that day because he took the name that God used to identify himself to Moses at the burning bush. You might remember Moses at the burning bush, and uh, he says, uh, God says, go free the people. And Moses says, well, who should I say sent me? And God's reply is, I am sent you. I am the preexistent one. I am the one that meets your needs. I am what you need. I am who you need. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, that was a clear throwback to say, I'm the same person that stood at the burning bush and gave Moses that command, those instructions. So Jesus takes that name for God and applies it to himself in a way that was relevant for everybody then and all of us today. I am the bread of life. A third one, this discourse is full of repetition. There's repeated statements here. Uh, for example, he'll say, I am the bread of life, and he says it three times. He says, God will raise up the believer at the end of time, and he says that a couple of times. He refers to the will of God three different times. And then the unbelief of the listeners is revealed to us multiple times as well. Now, why do you think Jesus needs to repeat the message, the message of this bread of life discourse? How many of you get every lesson the first time? How many of you spouses, you've been like, that's what I was trying to tell you in all those other ways, you know? I sometimes chuckle uh, my Children will discipline their children. And they'll say, you know, I don't know, no running, don't talk back, be nice to your brother, whatever. And I'll say, doesn't that feel good that you've covered that? You'll never have to deal with that again? Never to be brought up again. No, I think we all need multiple lessons. And so when Jesus repeats something, there's a reason for it. And there's multiple repetition. I also like the fact that he addressed our most basic needs. When he says, I am the bread of life, he's talking about foundational. He's talking about nutritional. He's talking about what will sustain us over time, and it's him. When we get into the text, we're going to see that he refers to hungering and thirsting. And he's going to say, when you come to me, you no longer have to hunger. You no longer have to thirst because your most basic needs of life will be met and found in me. Your needs for security and your need for significance and your need for worth and value and identity and dignity and security, they're all going to be found and they're going to be met in the one that provides the bread of life. Uh, one more uh, introductory thought here, and I'm going to say ouch on this one, because Jesus exposes their shallow motives. Jesus exposes their shallow motives. And that's where we're going to begin diving in today. They're not seeking him out of depth of, I want to know the Son of God. We're going to find out. Verse 22. <clears throat> Let's begin there. Verse 22 of uh, John 6. On the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they had ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats, came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because 
you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him who sent whom he sent. All right, so the people are looking for Jesus. When we start in verse 22, they're looking for him, and it just fascinates me. They're like taking inventory. They're at the shore of the Sea of Galilee. They're like, this boat was here. This boat wasn't here. And uh, he maybe crossed to the other side. Where's Jesus at? And they're all scurrying around, trying to find where Jesus might be. And when they meet up with them, they're not like, hey, it's nice to see you. You know, what can you teach us? Where have you been? And Jesus comes right out and says in verse 26, you're looking for me because you want more food. You want the free cookies that we were passing out yesterday, and you've come back looking for those. And he exposes their kind of shallow motives. So in verse 27, he says, don't labor for food that perishes. He makes a little contrast, food that perishes and food which endures, endures to everlasting life. And he's about to go through the process. What's it look like to find food that endures? That's what the Son of Man's going to give. What's food that endures? And so verse 28, what do we have to do to get it? So if you mark in your Bibles at all, find the word do or perform. What do we have to do to get this food that endures? Because that's the question people ask. And what did Jesus give for an answer? He said, here's what you need to do. The work I want you to do is to believe. Believe in me. There's something in us that just wants to do, that wants to earn, that doesn't want the free ride. It's why religion exists. Religions exist because somebody wants to do something. In fact, we could spell religion D-O, do. And Jesus said, I want you to believe what's been done for you, D-O-N-E. And later in this discourse, he's going to say, I'm the bread of life. I'm giving my life for you. My blood will be shed. My body will be broken. And I want you to believe what's been done for you. It's not about doing. It's believing. There's not anything that we can do to make God love us more. We're, he's not impressed with us. Now, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But he is going to love us. It's not about doing. It's about believing. And so Jesus' answer is believe. And what he's going to get into here is explaining salvation from our side of things and then explaining salvation from God's side of things. So explaining salvation from our side of things, there's a personal responsibility to believe. Understanding salvation from God's side of things there's the understanding that God knows who's going to be saved and God chooses those who are going to be saved. I had it explained to me like this. When we get to heaven, the gate over uh, the entrance into heaven, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then when we get through the gate and we turn around and look back from God's side, it'll say chosen before the foundation of the world. In verse 35 in our text, Man's side, Jesus says it. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But then in verse 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me, I will not cast out. And so there's a human side to our relationship with God, and there's a God side of things as well. So let's talk about the human side, personal responsibility. And we're going to start in verse 30, and let's track one of the ways to study this discourse, by the way, is to track the statements from the crowd. You know, their first statement was, how did you get here? And their second one was, what do we have to do to be saved? 
And here's their third one, verse 30. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe, believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. So their comment to Jesus was, hey, we had man in the desert back there in the days of Moses. That's kind of what we were thinking. How often did the manna come? Six days a week. And for how long did the manna come? For 40 years. And so what they're saying to Jesus is, you're going to do this once and you're calling that good? We showed up. We came back because our pattern, our idea was from the uh, wilderness, 40 years. You're going to have to up your game, Jesus, because Moses did so good back there. If you're really who you claim to be, you're going to do better than Moses. We're expecting better from you. One day, that doesn't cut it with us. So Jesus offers two denials, a double denial, and then he makes an offer to them. So denial number one. Jesus said it was not Moses that gave you the bread. It wasn't Moses that gave you the bread. That came down from God in heaven. That came from heaven. It wasn't Moses. And then the second thing, he says the bread that God gave wasn't the main point. It was never about the bread. It was about the provider. It wasn't the provision was the provider so when you go to lunch today and you give thanks to god for the food it's not about the food is it it's about the one that made the food possible it's the one that provided the sustenance it's the one we look to every day for strength it's the one we look to for our worth and our identity and our eternal life and our significance and our value it's about him You see, God wanted people to go out every day of those 40 years and trust that God would provide, trust that God would deliver. It wasn't about the food. It was about trusting the deliverance of God. And then Jesus makes an offer, verse 33. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's letting them know it never was about the bread. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. It's about himself. And we can get hung up on rules. We can get hung up on freedom. But if we take either of those extremes, I'm free to do this, or here's what the rules are, I've got to follow. If we do either of those things and we miss the person who's behind it all, if we miss the key man, the key person, then we've missed the point. How about the global nature of this? Do you see it there? He's offering this life, eternal life, to the world. And so we get worked up around here about offering that life to the world. And we invest financially and we invest personnel in seeing that gospel message taken to the world. But people have a responsibility to respond. At the end of verse 32, he says, My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Here's this offer Will you accept it? Here's the offer that's being made. Will you accept it? This bread is a picture of the person of Jesus Christ. It's not a place that we go. It's not an object that we would hold up. 
some icon that we might celebrate or worship. It's the person of Jesus Christ. That's the offer. The offer is eternal life. My Father gives this true bread. Look at verse 33, another phrase. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven. So Jesus is stating very clearly, I existed long before my physical birth into the physical world. The theological term is the pre-existent Christ. And he's saying, I existed long before this physical life. I I came into the world. And finally, we get to verse 35, and Jesus says it as clear as can be. I am the bread of life. Now, there's three massive realities in verse 35 for us to hang on to. Three massive realities. Reality number one is the reality of my hunger and thirst. That's reality. At some point, physically, we're all going to get hungry or we'll get thirsty. We all want our lives to count. We want peace. We want to be happy. We want to be liked or loved or appreciated. There's some longings in every one of us. And when Jesus says, I'm the bread of life, and when you come to him, you're never going to hunger, and you believe in him, you're never going to thirst, he's addressing our real, most basic, fundamental needs. They're found in him. These longings don't mean that you're weak. They mean that you're human. If you're long, man, I just want somebody to love me. I want somebody to care. I want somebody to know that I exist. I want a life of significance. I want peace in my life. I just want to be happy. That proves you're human. So you're not weak. But what happens in our humanity is we look at a lot of different places for those longings to be fulfilled. The Blind, the movie The Blind is going to be shown to the ladies here in a few weeks. And it was last year they showed The Jesus Revolution, a movie about contemporary Christian music and that movement in the late 60s, early 70s. There's a a fascinating quote uh, from that movie that says people are asking all the right questions about their longing. They're just looking to the wrong answers. They're looking to the wrong place for answers. So Jesus talked about hunger and thirst. That's just reality. That's where we're at. We've all got those longings for our lives to matter. But reality number two, those longings are only satisfied in Jesus Christ. You can look a lot of places, and everybody is. We only have to look out on our world at all the places people are looking. But there's only one source of true contentment, real security, acceptance, and value, and love, and freedom from guilt, and forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. Now, you might be ahead of me there, and you're thinking, well, I got saved, and I know who God is, but I still have that longing. I still get thirsty. I still get hungry. Again, that just means you're human. But what this text does is it tells us where to turn. It stops us from putting our ladders against the wrong building. So when we get to the top and we discover all my effort to get to the top of this building has been for naught because it's the wrong building. It tells us where to build our lives. It tells us what the foundation is, who the foundation is. And every time those longings arise, we remember who's running the universe. That I don't have to be the one to conjure up my own peace and I don't have to fix everybody and everything because somebody else is running the universe. And a third reality from this is that I have to come to him. I must come to him. That's where the decision, the personal responsibility comes. Verse 35, he says, he who comes to me shall never hunger 
He who believes in me shall never thirst. So that comes to me, believes in me, parallel text, parallel ideas. They're saying the same thing, that we come to him, we believe in Christ. Now, a big challenge here with this is that when we come to Christ, it's on his terms, not our terms. And a lot of us really want to come to Christ on our terms. And, well, I'll clean up or I'll, I'll come my way. I'll hold back just a little bit. And so that call to make him the source of our hunger and the answer to our thirst is to come to him on his terms. When we come to verse 36, one of the more sad texts of Scripture. I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. They were looking for the free cookies. They were looking for the handouts. They thought it was about the bread, the manna that came down. So he begins to offer his sovereignty, the God side of things. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But when we look from the other side, when we get to heaven, it's going to say God knew who was going to be here. God chose who was going to be here, chosen before the foundation of the world. Look at verse 36. I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven. There's that phrase repeated. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life and will raise him up at the last day. The sovereignty of God is God's authority, his foreknowledge, his will, his purpose. He's the boss, and he decides. It's God's sovereign work, and there's five statements found in this text that we can make about God's sovereign work. One is that he gives his chosen ones to Jesus. All that the Father gives me. So there's something in the divine mind that God knows who's going to be saved, and he passes those precious souls on to the Son. Call it foreknowledge. Romans 8 and verse 29 talks about it being predetermined that we become children of God. But then the second statement we can make, because God the Father gives them to the Son, they come to the Son. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And coming to him means believing in him. God knows you will be saved, and he calls you to himself. And for so many of you, he's worked in your life leading up to this. And for so many of you, he's at work in your life even now, calling you to himself. And when you believed, it was God opening your eyes and how we can pray for people. God, would you open their eyes, open their eyes that they may see and understand your truth. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. What it says is, Jesus will not lose those that are put into his care. A term we like to use to describe that is eternal security. Whose job is it to keep you saved? It says right there that those that are put in the care of Jesus will be kept by Jesus. It's his job to keep you saved. Question for you, what is there you... You, what did you do? What could you have done to earn your salvation? Is there anything you could have done to earn your salvation? No, not a thing. It's purely the grace of God. So what is there that you could do to unearn it? Virtually anything that we would do would get us booted out of the family because there's nothing I could have done that got me in it question for you. How many of your sins did Jesus die for? 
All of them. So if there's a sin that gets you kicked out of God's family, then you've hit on a sin that evidently he didn't die for. He died for all of your sins. By the way, it's called eternal life for a reason. It's not called temporary life. It's not called maybe your hope so life. It's eternal life. And it begins when we receive Christ and we get saved. It's God's job to keep us saved. Because if it was up to us, we would have all fallen away many times before. It's God's job. And it says here, Jesus said, the son does not lose or reject anybody that comes to him. Two more statements and we'll wrap up. Jesus said that he will raise up the believer at the last day. He would raise up the believer, raise us up as believers at the end of time. Jesus knows what death looks like. He faced it. He defeated it when he rose from the dead. And that same promise is for believers today that we will rise with him and spend eternity with him. It's eternal life. And the unshakable foundation of it all is the will of God. Three times, verse 38, 39, and 40. It's the will of God. It's the will of God. It's the will of God. The purpose of God, the purpose of God, the purpose of God is being played out. God's at work. Nothing is more sure than the word of God. The point of this discourse is to keep us from pursuing those longings in unhealthy ways. The purpose of this discourse is to keep us from building our lives on something that doesn't last. But to draw our attention and focus to build our lives on Jesus Christ, food that endures, it's the person of Christ. It's not a thing, it's not a place, it's not an icon. It's the person of Christ. Would you stand with me, please, with your heads bowed? The worship team's going to come. I want to talk with you about and ask you to consider right now what you're building your life on. What are you depending on for those longings to be satisfied? Another relationship, another job, another place. Another thing. Oh, if we could avoid those mistakes and the heartaches and the disappointments when we create expectations about that which was never intended, never designed to satisfy those longings. God in heaven, all across this room are people with longings. We're hungering and thirsting for acceptance, for peace, for joy, relief from the guilt, and on and on. We're human. And in that humanity, we've looked a lot of places Today, God, we find that it's only in Christ when we build our lives on you. That's where real peace, real joy, that's food that endures to everlasting life. May we build our lives on you. God, I pray that you'd work in our teams at Teen Camp this week. In Jesus' name, the bread of life. Josh and our team's going to lead us in a closing song. Don't.